Nicole Violet here, second generation homeschooling mom of three. I have an eight year old, a five year old, and an infant. Today I wanted to share with you some subject specific professional development books. So let's get into it. So in my general education professional development books video, I talked about how I like to devote time in the summer to reading books that will help me become a better educator for my kids. And so today I wanted to share with you books that provide strategies for specific subjects. So let's start with math. This book is called Mathematical Mindsets by Joe Bowler. And this one, they're all, all of these books are written to teachers pretty much, um, except for Noah and Tell. But this one I found a little bit denser than the others. I didn't find it difficult to read. I just thought it was a little bit denser, just FYI. So what I really appreciate about this book is she talks about how we learn math. And then she also really talks about how beautiful math is and how, about how important a growth mindset is when we're learning math and how we can use that growth mindset framework to help teach math more effectively. So all of those things kind of blended together effective learning strategies and effective teaching strategies and then helping your kids see the beauty of math and then promoting that growth mindset which my kids definitely struggle with at times um, this this book was just really really helpful for me for all of that so she has a lot of examples a lot of them are classroom examples but I still found this really helpful for thinking about how we approach math in our homeschool the next book I have is Reading Reconsidered by Doug Limov, and so it's a guide to rigorous literacy instruction. This one is very geared towards teachers in classrooms, so he talks a lot about close reading, which is uh, very important in the Common Core framework. I, I don't think my kids have done any close reading yet. We use Fish Tank ELA for our literature, and so they do have close reading assignments, but I skimmed sections of this book because I felt like they were so geared towards the classroom, but I did find some really helpful like thought provoking things to think about in this. The big one for me <laughs> that I've been mulling over recently is he talks about how if you want your kids to read complicated texts when they're older, you have to start introducing texts that are kind of the precursors to those when they're younger. So specifically for me, we use Fish Tank ELA, which is a lot of modern literature. But if you want your kids to be able to read more classical literature when they're older, then you need to start building the foundations of that now. So for me, that means that I've been thinking about incorporating each year a book that I find less problematic or if I can find one that's not problematic, uh, more classical literature to kind of get my kids used to some of that more complicated sentence structure and vocabulary and things like that. Fish Tank ELA does have some classical-ish but like the, in third grade my daughter will read Charlotte's Web which I consider a children's classic um, but just for our read-alouds I usually pick a lot of modern stuff and so I'm thinking about next year maybe trying to pick um, some older things as well to start to build that vocabulary and stuff. I don't know, this one just gave me some things to think about that I thought was helpful. This next book is written for homeschoolers. I think it's the only one I have that is. It's No and Tell, The Art of Narration by Karen Glass. She's one of the founders of Ambleside Online, which is a free Charlotte Mason curriculum online. It is not secular. So her background and the way she talks about narration is coming from a Charlotte Mason perspective. So a lot of the resources that I use are classical and narration is a big thing in classical education as well, but the emphasis is a little bit different. So I thought it was really interesting to read this after reading Susan Wise Bauer's um, The Well-Trained Mind and kind of just comparing the emphasis in both of them. I think they're very similar. We do a lot of narration in, we use writing with ease. And then I have my kids narrate for like history and science, things like that. Um, but she breaks down what you should be looking for in narrations, how to effectively scaffold narrations, different kinds of narrations you can do. She talks about doing, um, Picture narrations where your child will draw a picture and then explain the picture to you as their narration. Doing narrations where you're reenacting whatever it was that you went over. So like if you read a fairy tale with your child and you asked them to narrate it back to you, one of the forms that narration can take is them using their toys to retell the story as like a little play or something like that. So she talks about different forms of narration that comes into play more in elementary, although older kids can use some of those as well, especially for science. Diagrams are very effective narration tools. Um, but she talks about what you should be looking for in narration at each stage and what you're building towards in terms of using narration as a tool for developing thinking and organizing thoughts and then and like synthesizing and elaborating on thoughts and then also how it relates to writing. Um, and so, like I said, this is very Charlotte Mason-y 
She comes from a very Charlotte Mason background, so the way that I'm approaching writing is not how necessarily she approaches it here, but I do think that the interplay between narration and writing is really interesting, so I thought this book was really helpful as well. The next two books I have both talk about writing, The Writing Revolution and The Writing Rope. The Writing Revolution is by Judith C. Hockman and Natalie Wexler. Natalie Wexler also wrote The Knowledge Gap, and then The Writing Rope is by Joan Sedita. So both of these books are really good. They both talk about the importance of writing across content and they both provide exercises and tools to help you teach your kids how to write, but they do approach it from slightly different angles. So I'm gonna, let's start with The Writing Revolution. This book talks a lot about the importance of sentences and it talks about how if you can't write an effective sentence, you can't progress on from there. Like if you can't even write an effective sentence, how are you going to be able to write an effective paragraph or an effective essay? So she gives a lot of exercises and different things to work on with sentences. And then after that, she does move on to single paragraph essays and from there to more complicated essays. But I would say that the main focus of this book is sentences. And most of the exercises that she provides are for sentences. And then she does have in the back what you should be working on in each grade. And she does have things for starting in grade one, although a lot of the things that you'll do at that age are oral. I did with my daughter start doing the writing revolution style exercises in kindergarten, I think, just because they're part of fish tank. And uh, and then in first grade, we use the ones in fish tank. And then we also use Lit House Learning's history exercises, which are all based on the writing revolution's methodology. And then I've used some for science as well, just kind of depending on what what we're working on. And then in the back of this book, they have different worksheets and you can, if you make an account on their website, you can print out the worksheets for free. So I really like this book. I don't think it's necessarily a revolution. Like I think a lot of the ways that she talks about teaching writing are the ways that I was taught to write. Um, my mom taught me to write, but the specific exercises that she gives you are really effective tools. And so I really, really like all of those things in here. I've only used it for sentence level stuff, so I can't speak to how the higher level stuff will go. We'll see when we get there, but so far I really, really like this. I haven't put together too many of my own writing revolution exercises yet. This next year I might do more, we'll see, but I've been really pleased with my daughter's progress with the writing revolution stuff we've done so far. So the writing rope is a little bit of a broader overview. And this is definitely written to a classroom teacher. There's tons of valuable information in here for a homeschooler too, but just the kind of the way she approaches it struck me as a lot more classroom focused than the writing revolution for whatever reason. But she talks about all the different strands of the writing rope. And so all of these strands of the writing rope she discusses in here and how to effectively teach them. I do feel like some of these strands, I wish she'd gone into a little bit more in depth. Like the writing in these, I feel like she, fo she focuses on the um, higher levels of writing a lot more than the writing revolution does. Like when she is talking about sentences, she talks about how kids need to be able to write effective sentences. And then she has like very short examples of things you can do to help your kids have more effective sentences. Whereas the writing revolution spends a lot of time breaking down all the different things you can play with with sentence structure. So I think I really like this book. I like how it's laid out. I like the worksheets and things that they have, but I definitely would not start with this. I would start with the writing revolution. And then if you're having trouble with the higher like essays type, how the writing revolution explains doing them, I would look at this resource. I think this resource, um, this resource also even says that it's for fourth grade and up. Um, so it's definitely geared towards older kids writing. But I do think it was really helpful. Next I have for history, from story to judgment, the four question method for teaching and learning social studies. And so what this is, is when you're setting up your history lessons, this is geared more towards older kids who are starting to do analysis, I should say. Like my elementary age kids I'm not using these to craft the history lessons yet, um, but I did think it was a really interesting read. So essentially the four questions are what happened, narration, that's kind of where my kids are right now. What, what happened? What can you tell me? Synthesize and summarize. Question two, so at the older level, you'll be doing all four of these questions for every history lesson. Question two is what were they thinking, where you have to interpret the events. Question three is why did those events happen then and there? So you have to explain and that has, you have to call on a lot of background knowledge to be able to do that, which is part of why this method is more for like, I would say high school level history. You could bring some of it in for middle school, but you really have to be able to have the background knowledge to do the explanation and the next question, what do we think about that judgment? Because in order to be able to judge something effectively, you kind of have to 
know where they're coming from, how it compares to now. It just There's just a lot of background knowledge you need to have in order to be able to do especially those last two questions effectively, in my opinion. And they talk about the importance of background knowledge in here as well. But they give you all sorts of charts and frameworks and things to think about when you're setting up your history lesson. So I thought this was an interesting read as well. All right, and then the last book that I have is For Science, Helping Students Make Sense of the World Using Next Generation Science and Engineering Practices. So this is talking about the next generation science standards and how we can effectively teach science. So it's talking about... A lot of it is about what is the role of inquiry in the science classroom? How do we use inquiry effectively? What is inquiry and what does all of that look like? And then also analyzing, reflecting, how do we engage in the practice of science? How do we have students do that? How do we make sure they have the background knowledge to be able to engage in science? What's the role of the teacher in scaffolding all of this? So this is a thick old book, but I thought it was really helpful for thinking about how to set up science lessons and kind of just what is our goal when we're teaching kids science? Do we want them to just know the science facts or do we also want them to develop all of these skills that go along with being a scientist, specifically the inquiry and analysis and more complicated math stuff like practical math applications and things like that. So I thought this book was really helpful as well. So I hope this was helpful for you. I will link everything in the description box below. I am an Amazon affiliate. So if you click on an Amazon link and make a purchase, I do receive a small commission. Thank you for watching.